All right, all right, all right. Uh, let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. <laughs> well hello and welcome to the actual anarchy podcast podcast where we talk about movies from a rothbardian and narco capitalist perspective tonight we're going to be talking about and the band played on this is episode 173 of the show you can find the show notes more at actualanarchy.com slash 173 and during this unprecedented time, we wanted to reach out to you today and assure you that we are monitoring the coronavirus COVID-19 situation closely and are working with uh, health and safety uh, officials to make sure that this situation, which has been already disruptive to very many businesses across the globe, uh, that we are taking every precaution as we talk about this movie tonight with our returning guest, John Reed. Uh, and we will be discussing pandemics in general and as related to the AIDS epidemic as depicted in the film. We are uh, taking preventative measures, like I said, both Robert and I are uh, utilizing virtual meeting technology and working from home during this uh, crisis situation. We're both in uh, FEMA Region 10, and our guest will be calling in from FEMA Region 3. And this is, of course, uh, actuallyanarchy.com slash 173 for the show notes and more. Uh, let's check in with my co-host and hetero life mate, Robert Johnson. How you doing, sir? Oh, pretty good. I had a... Uh eyeball explosion earlier today i pulled a joe biden where my uh eyeball just erupted so if i start speaking and babbling incoherently i'm either having a stroke so call some emergency services or i'm just got early onset dementia like the old uh, sloppy joe himself i don't know the uh front runner for the the nomination <laughs> the i mean, democratic nomination i thought that they were going to go uh sort of limping into this contested convention situation and then someone out of left field uh perhaps from 2016 would um make rear their ugly head yet once again and give us a redux that would have been pretty funny a shillery i was thinking maybe like oprah would finally say something but i guess i mean she's been linked to epstein so maybe i don't know they got enough dirt on her so she could actually do it but i don't know it looks more and more like it's going to be crazy uncle joe and uh, I think it might be somewhat entertaining, but I don't know. I think people pay too much attention to this crap and give politicians way too much credence. I don't know if you're like me, you get way too annoyed that anytime anybody's talking about COVID, everybody's looking for some politician to say something about it. Or, I mean, at least it's a doctor every once in a while, but most of the time it's just like some government response and they're talking to some governor or some douchebag in a suit about what they're going to do about it. It's like, this is how we solve problems. We, we go to government, we run the government. They fucking love it. I do remember back when we were playing basketball on the court in front of your house, and we would think of ways to solve problems in the world. I mean, this is long, long ago. And, and I think that it was part of the uh, government indoctrination centers that we went to that the solution was often Oh, what's what should government do about it? What law should get passed? What bills should be uh, created? Uh, and so, unfortunately, that's kind of where everyone has been led to, and that's where that's what brings us to where we are today. Unfortunately, yeah, I mean, I get that people want a return on their investment. If they're going to get robbed for their tax dollars all the time, they want to get something out of it. So they want the government to do something, but they never realize that it's always worse. The more government does, the worse it is. The more they steal, the worse it is. And every time you want them to do something, they're always going to need more money to do that thing. So it's just, it, it's it's the scene and the unseen. And then it's also the scene of what government absolutely fucks up trying to do. Yeah, I certainly agree with you there. And uh, we like to check in on your business um, during this portion of the show. So real quickly, and then we'll get in the last nurse portion of the show and introduce our guest. 
Uh, how has this impacted you uh, for the immediate, um, you know, next period here? Well, it's a shit show. It has uh, Inslee came out and declared just by the stroke of a pen or because some asshole on Olympia says a thing, everybody follows along and does it, which really annoys me. But he came out and said that all restaurants are going to be takeout only now for the foreseeable future or until further notice. So that means that we showed up on a Monday with the, the, the declaration not even taking effect yet. And our proactive landlords, which is fine. It's their private property. They can do what they want. They came in and said, okay, we're cordoning off the dining room. So all your customers today are going to be takeout only. It's like, okay, we haven't discussed this at all. It doesn't take effect yet, but okay, whatever. And then another venue, our Wednesday venue, shut down entirely. So that's out. And then Friday, they say you can only do, this is another venue. They say you can do takeout only, but you can't actually have any customers inside the building at all. So they have to stand around outside and hopefully not get too cold and get you know sick waiting around outside for the food. So we have to uh, restructure the whole manner in which we take orders and deliver the food and all that sort of thing. So it's it's more work for us. Uh, it's probably going to take a little bit more labor cost. And uh, we'll see. Uh, the numbers on Monday were not good. So I don't know if we're going to be able to weather this storm. Hopefully, but we might end up shutting down. In which case, all our employees would be out of a job. Yeah, it's a benevolent gov government there uh, to help, uh, apparently. Now, um, I just out of curiosity, what's the supply chain issue? I know that uh, there's been a lot of runs on food, uh, food stuff, staples, toilet paper, rice, et cetera. Has that affected you and impacted you? Um, uh, and just in response, it is great that you are persevering and trying to overcome the challenges ahead of you. But uh, before we get into the last night's portion of the show, what's the supply chain like? Well, we go through a, um, well, first of all, we've, we've looked into multiple different suppliers. There are big retail suppliers that, you know, ship directly to you and they are far more expensive than our situation. Although our current situation is seeing increased prices and quota limitations on how much you can buy. So we go through a supplier in Seattle. The price for a bag of rice went up from 38 to 48, you know, in like a week. And then also there's a cap to 10 bags that you can buy. And that's just one product. Um, meat and vegetables hasn't really been super impacted yet. I, I don't think people are really stocking up on, you can't really stock up on vegetables, right? So you're going to be okay there. But people are buying dry goods like it's no tomorrow. So those things are taking a hit. Uh, but um, meat hasn't really been hit too badly yet. So I don't think people are just stuffing their freezers full of cows. At the moment, um, we're doing okay there. And that's the majority of our stuff is rice, meat, and vegetables. So it's really just kind of coming down to rice for the most part is where we're kind of sticking and we're running low. And uh, hopefully we can keep going and get some more. But if we run out of that, then, yeah, I don't, I don't know how we could really keep going. Um, maybe offer some kind of riceless options. But yeah, it's, it's not a great time to be in the restaurant business. Let me tell you, Daniel. There's enough challenges as it is, and uh, it's only getting more and more difficult. All right, well, lot, in, including including, of course, all the people that are staying home due to the increased risk, right? Or at least the perceived increased risk in getting infected. So numbers are down, prices are up, and margins are lower than ever. And it's a question of, yeah, are we even going to be in business in a month? Don't know. All right. Well, thank you for the update. So, like, sounds like the squeeze is on. It's the Anaconda squeeze, to quote one of our older movies we did a couple of years ago. Well, it's like, yeah, anytime you hear a government person say, I'm here to help, you're just like, stop helping. Please. Yeah. Please just leave us alone. 
All right. Well, uh, this has uh, been a, a sobering conversation already, and let's get into the movie in the last night's portion of the show uh, right after these messages. Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson, and we are the Last Nighters, and the Last Nighters can be found on the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. This is episode 116 of the show, and uh, shit, I know shit's bad right now, with all the starving bullshit and dust storms. We are running out of french fries and burrito coverings, but I've got a solution. Now, I understand everyone's shit's emotional right now, but I've got a three-point plan that's going to fix everything. Number one, we got a guy, John Reed. Number two, he's got a higher IQ than any man alive. And number three, he's going to fix everything. John Reed is a communications professional who's been a writer and video creator for the past 20 years. He enjoys debating current events and explaining the blessings of liberty and how to get it, along with long walks on the beach. John's a movie buff, wine lover, introvert, who enjoys time chilling at home or hanging out with a select few people who spike his intellect and curiosity and cats. Yes, he's a cat person and he's about to get married. Welcome back to the show, John. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here once again. All right. Well, we are uh, happy to have you here. Uh, this is an unprecedented time um, in our pre show bonus content of over normally available for our Patreon supporters. Uh, we were talking about how we're all beaming in from different FEMA regions and uh, Due to the pandemic, epidemic, uh, crisis, panic, uh, hysterics that are going on in the world today. And we just happened to have already selected this movie long ago, or you selected this movie long ago, and the timing is just about right. Mm -hmm. so, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, there's a lot going on for sure. And uh, this movie gives us plenty to discuss, even, you know, not specific to the movie, but just uh, current day events and maybe how they relate. So um, anyway, without further ado, should we start like we normally do with the Google description? All right. Motion carries. Uh, mm -hmm. And the band played on uh, 1993 here, but I think I saw it said uh, 1992 elsewhere. It's an HBO film, two hours and 21 minutes, 7.8 IMDb, 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, and 87% of Google users liked it. The description reads, in 1981, uh, epidemiologist Don Francis, played by Matthew Modine, learns of an increased rate of death among gay men in urban areas. The startling information leads him to begin investigating the outbreak, which is ultimately identified as AIDS. His journey finds uh, mostly opposition from politicians and doctors, but several join him in his cause. And as it becomes apparent that people have personal reasons to turn the other cheek, Francis persists. Meanwhile, the number of deaths continue to grow. This came out on September 11th, 1993. The director is Roger Spottiswood, and I believe he also did um, some uh, Bond movies, uh, Casino Royale, perhaps. Uh, so this was an HBO film. It won a primetime Emmy for Outstanding Television Movie, and that is the description so far. Uh, I'll go to Robert for his take on that and his opening information. I don't really have a whole lot of opening information, but I will give you my take on what you said, Daniel. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank you for quoting my namesake film in your little intro there, Daniel. I don't know how many people caught that, but I appreciated that. Mr. Cruz, I believe. Is that right? To Mr. Terry Cruz? That's right. Yes. Uh, President Camacho. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. So I... I can see why Matthew Modine, I don't know why he was a thing ever, but I can see why he was a little bit of a thing for a little while. I, he always strikes me as like the terrible actor. He reminds me of Marty McFly's dad when he goes up to Biff and he's like, Hey man, get your damn hands off her. As he's trying to get Biff out of the car when he's like getting on to his woman. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's got a Crispin Glover vibe. Yeah, for sure. And not only that, but just like bad actor Chris Crispin Glover vibe. So I I I have a problem with Matthew Mead. I'm glad he's not in more films. So when I do see him, it's like, man, really? Him again? But there's not a lot. So it's fine. Um, this film, man, we saw Contagion recently, 
which was a terrible movie that failed at you know making it a human story this massive pandemic that's killing millions of people this movie is a much more intimate affair so focuses on a certain few people and we get to follow them throughout their journey of discovery and you know fighting and conflict and that sort of thing so for me this was a much superior film it it actually was a human film you, you felt things for these characters as they were trying to achieve this great thing which is you know saving people's lives and curing this disease so uh, it's nice to watch these two films fairly close to get close together um because you know there's a real comparison between the two and uh, I know I, I think this one's just far superior um it's not as beautifully shot obviously it's it's you know dated in the looks department but it's got a lot of famous people the talents to the film um, apparently it's taken from a very long exhaustive kind of dictionary type book and i think they came together and they formed a pretty solid narrative for the film i mean it follows unfortunately the cdc doctors which are the you know government bureaucrat type so they're always dealing with this funding and i'm sure we can get into that that's you know probably going to be a, a good chunk of my discussion points is they're always looking for more money in order to justify their existence or to try to you know combat this new disease and they have to convince other people that it's a problem and like in the 80s and the 70s there in the movie shows this massively i mean if it was today i think it'd be vastly different right with all the social justice going on and if anything's happening to the uh the rainbow squad then there's a huge massive uproar on twitter about it and there's all kinds of people running and jumping at the get to at the bit to you know, throw money at it or to help them in any way or at least they pretend to or at least they're vocal voices about it back then it was much more of a in the closet situation where people didn't talk about it and yeah it's it's it's, it's a different time it really highlights the different times in which we live so this is if nothing else this is a fun time capsule type movie to talk about yeah i'm gonna agree with you on a lot of that um i also kind of saw this as a bit of a left leaning hit piece against conservatism and Republicans. Oh, uh, sure. They, they ripped on Reagan a bunch. Yeah. And, and the, uh, you know, the stupid rubes, the country folk, uh, who didn't know that, you know, men could have sex with another man. Um, you know, it, it just, it was kind of dripping in that, which is a bit unfortunate. Uh, it kind of took me out of this because I could see the agenda being played out, uh, during that. But I agree with you. It is a uh, more humanized depiction of an epidemic uh, as opposed to contagion, though contagion, the trailer for it, I mean, it looked like fascinating and, and thrilling and whatever. And then we watched it and it was kind of a bit of a, a dud, but it did yield a, a very good discussion. So I'm glad that we did that one. And I'm glad that we're doing this one as well. So, John, let's go to you. Now, you you studied film. Um, so why don't you respond to the Google description and then why you suggest suggested this way back when before all these events occurred uh, and and i'm wondering if it's from like maybe how the film was shot or presented because i, I kind of was looking for that just because you were the one who recommended it yeah well i remember um the first time i saw this was when it came on hbo and it was in the early 90s i was still in college back then and I was just struck not only by the ensemble cast, which you just can't overlook. There's got, they've got huge names in this film, uh, especially for that time. So uh, it's compelling in that sense, but also, you know, I was probably back then I was just coming out of my Democrat phase. I, I'd, I'd been a Bill Clinton supporter back um, like in 92. Um, so I was probably just coming out of that, but I was, you know, more libertarian minded. I was, very, you know, well, the gay population is, you know, just like you and me, they just want to live their lives. And, and they had this horrible disease befall them. And the government didn't respond. That's my mindset back then. 
Um, so I was very compelled by the film. And I, and also I thought it told a great story in the sense that like Robert said that, you know, it's a very dictionary like book, but it tells a very human story and it's, it's a long timeline to condense into a two and a half hour movie. And I thought it did it very well. Um, I thought that the, the, the story was very compelling. I thought it really drew you into the characters and um, it's always been one of my favorite films. And I think as far as like, you know, one of the HBO films, and I think I hadn't really watched it until a few years ago when I was, when I, I don't know why it came to mind, but I just thought like, I haven't seen it in a long time. Let me see. And it's still held up. I mean, I think it's, it's always going to be a very compelling story of, even if you watch it today. Um, and to the point that, you know, the, the bureaucracy, the CDC, the, the always looking for money, the sort of thing, I think we'll get into that a little more, but now that I've adopted more libertarian and, uh, and cap views, it's even more poignant because the whole thing that they're talking about is that the reason that this epidemic became what it was was because of lack of CDC funding, lack of government involvement, lack of government concern, especially during the Reagan years and the conservative Inc kind of mentality. Um, I think it's very poignant in the sense that it's not just uh, a Republican thing. It's more of a government thing. And, and how are you going to rely on the government when you're faced with a real health crisis involving whatever population, whether it's gay or in these days, like the general population? Yeah, I think that that's a that's a pretty good take. And it sounds like you had a similar journey to us. Like we were sort of left leaning Clinton esque types um, way back when. But that was kind of back uh, in the era where it seemed like the left side was, hey, civil liberties, stay out of the bedroom. Government doesn't have any business poking around in there or mandating anything. And uh, it felt at the time that conservatives were the ones imposing their morality on everyone else. Yep. Now, it seems like the script has flipped a little bit. And uh, one of the key points that um, really stood out in the film to me was when they were talking about fighting the bureaucracy and uh, um, the city council meeting that they went to. And they're like, going to close the, the bathhouses or not. And the guy was saying, hey, we've carved out our own little enclave here where it's okay to be the way we are, mm -hmm. the Castro. And I thought, yeah, hey, that's totally cool. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, you should have the rights that anyone else has. But it seems today that now it's like you bake the cake or you're evil. You know, right. now, now it's everywhere. It's not just the Castro. It, now it's like imposed upon everyone else. It's like the morality of the conservatives back then was what was being imposed. And now it's the morality of the other side being imposed and sort of mandated that we all abide by and like, I don't know, worship at the altar of it's um, kind of a, uh, you guys get what I'm saying? I'm, I'm probably ham fisting this mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah, we I do, do Daniel. We do. All right. Well, good, good. I, I thought I could segue that into something, but I guess not. No, 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 no you could. <clears throat> you well, could. can I just say one other thing? No. Over. <laughs> Show's over. Fine. Show's over. The host has been shut down. Um, what do you guys say to the argument of um, viruses were here first, therefore they homesteaded this property, and we, <laughs> the humans, are the ones encroaching on their space? I wasn't expecting this to go there. No, I didn't either. No, this is yeah. a new one. I, I didn't know till recently that viruses are by far the most abundant form of life on Earth. Apparently, in the in a drop of seawater, there's like millions of them. They're just all over the place. But just a tiny, 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 tiny little percentage of them affect humans, which is, you know, good news for everybody, I suppose. Wow. But yeah, so everywhere. in that in that sense, yeah, we are the minority. And if they had voting rights, then, yeah, we would never get anything. So yeah. so much for democracy. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, John, maybe a little bit more on. um maybe the narrative of what is being told here, because I found just in watching it the first time through the um, over the two nights, because it you know takes us two nights to watch anything. I got a little bit lost and a little bit confused into some of the events that were happening and what the significance of those things were, because I am no 
uh, epidemiologist myself. Um, and I know they tried to dumb it down a little bit. They actually had a very glaring moment where they're like, had some guy ask some lady, so what did they mean in layman's terms? And then she explains to them. Um, but uh, I, I found it a little bit confusing, the narrative. And perhaps had I read the book or this, uh, you know, encyclopedic type book, maybe I'd understand it a little bit better. But can you run through like what kind of the, the process was in this film? Well, for instance, I mean, in the very beginning, you know, um, you, you have Dr. Don Francis played by Matthew Modine, um, who was one of the one of the doctors who was dealing with the Ebola crisis. And, you know, they, they set it up that way as kind of like a, a premonition of what was to come with AIDS. Um, now, it's, it's funny nowadays to look at what Dr. Francis did with the, the one patient in the hut who was dying of Ebola. You know, he took off his mask, took off his gloves, and she basically bled all over him. Um, the social distancing was really not relevant, I guess, back in the 1970s when you're dealing with Ebola. But um, I think one of the, the more early on in the film, I think one of the things that is set up really well, and I think that the kind of the, 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 the point of the film kind of loses um, going back to the, the, the blaming this on Reagan thing, um, when uh, Bill Krauss, uh, played by Ian McKellen, is, you know, he's a gay activist and he's basically addressing the committee that determines the, the Democratic national platform. And he's basically just asking them to accept the gay agenda and accept gays as humans. And he gets a very cold reception. And I think it's funny because as the the the, the film goes on, we're, we're we're seeing Reagan as like being insensitive to gays, and his administration and his policies are very cold to gays. But from the get go, um, the gay community doesn't even seem to have much buy in from the Democratic Party itself, except in San Francisco. Um, so I think I think that sets it up very very well as to the mindset at the time. And I grew up at that time. So I, I know pretty much what the, what the, what the attitude towards gays was in the early eighties, late seventies. And I, I, I think they, I'm not sure if they understand how much uh, that one scene plays into their narrative of, well, this is all just a Reagan kind of thing. Uh, he hated gays. So he was never going to help with the AIDS problem but I think that sets it up very well. And I think it's very accurate as to the attitude toward gays, even back then by Democrats, by the, the official Democratic Party. Now, just an offshoot of that later on in the film, uh, Gandalf is meeting with, I guess, a local congressman, a California congressman. And he's like, hey, you know, if you can just align some of these policies, you will have this voting block that can swing an election in an area like San Francisco. And that seemed to be the toehold in the um, politicians actually paying any credence to them. And but even he said, like, if he proposed any bill with, that had anything to do with gay people, it'd be shot down. So even he admitted that he was, you know, facing an uphill battle like, when, when, with the attitude toward mainstream uh perception of gays right yeah and you know i i i guess i'm a little bit younger not a whole lot younger but um i tend to think of um things like acceptance of lifestyles such as gay lifestyles or, or whatever were sort of introduced in primetime television yeah absolutely and it more um accepted uh, more normalized, if you will, like Will and Grace and, and uh, shows like that. And I always wondered if that was intentional, if that was like a um, kind of planned thing to to introduce such ideas and get them to become more acceptable by, you know, getting people while they're young or being entertained and making it uh, something that they're familiar with. I'll take my tinfoil hot head off now um, and go to Robert with uh, your response to that. No, if you can make people laugh and entertain them, and you can make someone likable, and you can make the audience connect with that person and like them, and then they just so happen to also be 
gay or have a particular point of view on a thing, then you're likely to be you know, much more positive towards that point of view. And that's, that's how movies have always in TV and entertainment have always influenced things. It's not that, it's not that my argument is so convincing. People aren't really convinced by arguments. They like people. Mm -hmm. And if you like me and you like, then you're more likely to like what I'm saying as right. opposed to like listening to my arguments and going, Oh no, that's a really good argument. Now there are certain libertarian autists and certain people in the world that have that computer brain that do respond well to arguments. I'm one of those people. I really like arguments. If I hear a great argument, I love it. This is fantastic. But most people are more about, do I like this guy? I mean, you can tell by, you know, who gets elected president or, you know, who's famous or who's popular. It's these charming people with a lot of charisma that can work a room that are naturally funny, that are witty and, you know, and just really have that person ability that can connect with people. And anyway, going back to your original point about uh, you wanted to say something and then spur a discussion. And you mentioned the, the they got together and they were going to like vote city council style on shutting down the bathhouses. And it just it's very real to what's happening now with Inslee just basically or a lot of governors around the country just shutting down companies, just saying public health risk. And you're no longer in business. It's now illegal for you guys to come in and do business. When shouldn't it be everybody's individual choice on whether or not they want to assume the risk to go in and patronize a business or not? Yeah. Now, yeah. what do you what do you think about this bathhouse incident? So these bathhouses are basically hotbeds for this disease spreading around. Well, you could say the same thing, the exact same thing for my restaurant and COVID-19. Now, you may not have the evidence yet that COVID-19 spreading around in my restaurant but you could make that argument and say well this is why i'm shutting it down because it very well could be a hotbed for this disease so in public health interests i'm shutting you down yeah what do we think what do we know and what can we prove mm. yeah well, I think the uh the, the the bathhouse instance i think also demonstrates because you have um i think her name was selma dritz uh played by lily tomlin who goes in and she's, you know, she's uh, a gay rights activist, but she's also a part of the Department of Health. So she has the authority to go in there and inspect the bathhouses and recommend shutting it down or not shutting it down. Um, but she's very aware of this health risk to the gay community and the, you know, the cause of which is very predominantly in these bathhouses. And she, it really has no authority. Again, we're going back to the, to the vote of the community, whether they want the bathhouses open or not. So in my estimation, like what good is the department of health? If they understand this very, very deadly health risk to the gay community, but even they can't go in and, 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 and shut down the, 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 one of the main causes of it in that community. So, I mean, you, we're all expecting the, the government to protect us even in COVID-19 times. But even back then when it was very clear, I mean, it seemed to be very clear, at least as far as the film uh, portrays that a lot of the, the gay men who were contracting this disease had been contracting it in a bathhouse. They couldn't do anything to, to, to stop it and protect the, the prevent the, the spread of the disease from going further. Yeah. They actually point out that they don't have the authority to do yeah. so. But um, my, how the times have changed. They apparently just assume the authority to do it on every non-essential business uh, or life-sustaining business uh, due, due to some criteria that they alone understand, as we discussed in the pre-show content, uh, that all business is life-sustaining business for those who run the business and those whose lives are made better by the services and goods provided by that business. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very interesting that back during this film, they didn't have the authority to shut it down, even though they had a high probability of suspecting that this was propagating this problem. And, and to bring it back again to that, um, to that meeting, uh, where Phil Collins was the, um, one of the, the bathhouse owners, they even said, uh, during that meeting that, Oh, you know, everyone's going to get a chance to make it known how they feel. Everyone will get a chance to share their emotional 
ness about the situation, not their argument, not fact, not, you know, logic. It's how do people feel about things? And unfortunately, that's how things get done. I mean, that's kind of what you were talking about, Robert, where, you mm -hmm. know, people who have a certain appeal to them or, or likability or um, have strong emotions can tend to get things uh, pushed through that aren't necessarily in the best interest of, of anyone. Uh, right. It's a government has a limited amount of resources and the loudest voices or the ones with the largest amount, biggest pocketbooks tend to get what they want. And this is a movie where the gay agenda, I don't even want to call it whatever the gay people in the, in the area were having this thing happening to them. And so they're, they raise their voices very, very loudly to try and get heard to try and get a piece of this government pie pointed towards curing this disease that or fighting this disease that was affecting them. But this is, this is what you get in a socialist world where you have to either be super, super loud about a thing and really make it inconvenient for other people so that it's you know, politically viable in order for it to get done, or you got to have a lot of money to gain a lot of influence. But right. in, that, in that scene, though, I mean, we're talking about pure democracy in that sense, like all those in favor of closing the bathhouses say aye, all those opposed. So that was really a pure democracy. So even then you saw how democracy couldn't even help these people who were facing this very serious health crisis. Um, you know, if, if you're talking about socialism, maybe you want to put a more authoritarian Department of Health kind of situation in which... I don't care what you say. We're going to close the bathhouses because we certainly don't want to spread this disease anymore. Or you're going to let the people who had currently felt oppressed by the conservative culture and felt more threatened by Reagan's brand of conservatism to live their lives and let their freak flags fly and just go on living the way they're living. Okay, well, if you're going to do that, then there are consequences to you making the choices that you oppose other people in, uh, opposing on, or, or imposing on you. Yeah. There's a lot of parallels uh, to today, right? Like we're being told to almost essentially shelter in place or, or only go out for essentials, work from home, maintain social distance, all of these things. And a lot of people are bristled by that. They're like, I don't fuck you. I won't do what you tell me. Right. The rage against the machine uh, mantra. And it makes some sense. Um, but I don't know. It's kind of interesting because in this um, in this moment of democracy, it's almost as if an authoritarian, a more um, empowered overseer state would be protecting these people from themselves. And it almost makes the argument for a government. But yeah. mm -hmm. um, I, I can't abide that. So I'm, I'm a little bit torn on this. Uh, because these people didn't think it was a threat. They didn't understand that it was a real problem because the the spread hadn't been significant enough to impact them enough to where it kind of s sunk in, you know? So well, in the, in, the, in the lifespan of the disease takes a long time to develop. In HIV, it takes, it could be years and years and years before you see the effects of it. And what, and what was the real precipitous of opposing the shutdown of the bathhouses to begin with. I mean, the, the, the one activist said, you know, this is another Reagan plot to push us back into the closet. So what they were really concerned with was not so much the health of their, of the gay community. It was more of, well, we're not going to let this bastard Reagan tell us how we're going to live our lives. We're going to do what we want to do and screw, you know, if we were, a more decentralized society, if San Francisco was its own kind of little republic, would they be more concerned with the health of their population rather than being concerned with whatever president happened to be in office had to say or think about them? So, Yeah, and it's almost like this um, COVID situation is almost like the thing to root out libertarians, you mm. know, those who <laughs> bristle like government. <laughs> be like, what? I'm not going to do that. You know, uh, and and I want to say that most of the time, you know, individuals know better than some overseer a thousand miles away. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's just kind of kind of crazy. Now, one last thing about that meeting. I, I don't know why we spent half the show talking about just this particular meeting, but um, Phil Collins 
forget his name, uh, Papasano. He goes up to the um, Don Francis. Uh, I think this is one of the, maybe the later meetings. And he's like, hey, we're all in it for the same thing, money. Mm-hmm. You know, I want the money when they're coming in and you get the money when they're going out and they're all sick. You doctors make all the money. And that just seemed like a low shot or a, um, a low. That was shot. definitely something that never happened. Definitely a conversation that never actually happened. But go but ahead, Daniel. It's, it's one of those left arguments where it's like, um, you know, medicine for profit is evil because it incentivizes doctors to keep you sick. Right. That kind of a thing. And, and that just kind of stood out to me. And it, that was just another piece of, um, I guess, the slant I was seeing in watching this film. Sure. Oh yeah, there was definitely a slant to it. I mean, there's I'm I'm not trying to um defend the film in the sense that I it, it didn't have a, like a left a slant or that definitely did. But you know, again, I think through its interpretation of the events that happened during that time, I think it's also exposing very much um how government does not protect us and whether you're pretending to be for the gay community or whatever community like the, there's a bureaucracy that you have to get over and the ultimate, the ultimate uh, determining factor is whether how much a bureaucracy can make off of you or how much they can uh, make by regulating whatever it is that you're involved with. But I think it's in, in its leftist slant, it's also exposing a lot of the faults with what it would ultimately like to see. Like if you gave the CDC more money, does that mean that AIDS would have gone away? I doubt it because I mean, first of all, the, the, the fact that Reagan was a president, Congress appropriates funds, Congress determ- votes on the budget. So they were in charge of determining how much money the CDC got. So it wasn't Reagan. Reagan didn't have like daily meetings of, uh, well, how much, how much are we going to screw the CDC so we can get those gays out of the, out of the, off the planet? Uh, it was very much a bureaucracy and the bureaucracy is beholden to the higher powers in government. Right. But even if the bureaucracy had more money, they would just be squandering it for the most part. Right. Uh, you know, it's almost like, yeah, sure. They're underfunded compared to what they want or the growth in the budget that they desire. Yeah. But if you didn't have government involved at all, then you wouldn't have this idea that the problem is already taken care of or being addressed. Right. And you would have competing firms trying to come up with solutions, market solutions that would be far faster, cheaper, better, faster, stronger, all this stuff. Um, and we saw it with COVID stuff uh, where FDA regulations were preventing tests from being um, uh, created fast enough. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's been like two or three different things that were related to um, people had to like overstep or, or go around certain guidelines. Or um, I think Trump came out and said that he was going to relax a lot of guidelines, especially when it comes to uh, FDA trials or even um, trucking requirements like minimum hours or maximum hours so that supply chains can be replenished as quickly as possible, things like that. I mean, it's like a, a tacit admission that the regulatory state is what's strangling the economy and strangling innovation and strangling things from happening. And then we get into, um, if I can pivot a little bit here, we get into the um, dick measuring contest between the competing like discoverers who are trying to patent the vaccine or patent the virus. You know, this is where IP kind of comes out and like is killing people because they're fighting over this. Right. These are the guys who are supposed to be their first priority is supposed to be helping the the public and curing whatever disease might be the 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 disease of the day and yeah like you said they're they're more concerned about whose name goes on the paper that discovers the virus and it's it's very it's very sick um and i wanted to go back to really really quick to the scene that don francis when he gets his uh workspace at the cdc just to go along with like the 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 funding to the CDC. He's got this office that's full of junk, full of old equipment, uh, full of, of equipment that is obviously woefully um, um, not enough to uh, do what he needs to do to properly research and solve this problem with this virus. Um, 
But, you know, everybody's just like, oh, well, there, there you go. I mean, that's it. Again, going back to, well, is this a Reagan problem? Because I have to feel that under Carter, the conditions probably weren't that much better. It's not like there was a utopia under Carter and then Reagan came in and immediately they got junk equipment and they didn't have enough resources. So it's it's very, um, I think it's very uh, shallow to kind of assume that, again, it goes back to, well, government's going to solve the problem. But you see right from that scene that even when Carter was in office, the legacy CDC that Reagan inherited wasn't wasn't equipped to handle the problem that they that the, the movie focused on. Right, and even if they had more money, right, uh, it would just you know be more squandered than than it was whatever money they did have. Right. I mean, they certainly did do some work. I mean, obviously they do some work, but uh, we it's it's the seen versus unseen. That, Robert, you were talking about this earlier. We can't know the counterfactual. We can't know what greater levels of innovation and, and technological advancement that would have solved a lot of these problems faster, cheaper, et cetera, uh, because they weren't permitted to happen. They were, mm -hmm. you know, they were, they were made illegal. Right. Or they are made so as impossible to come to the market. Like you're talking about how hamstrung the market is by government. Um, one criticism of the market is that small diseases aren't profitable enough to bring to the market. So the people, you know, it only affects like 50 people in the world. And so who would ever make a cure, right? Because there's just not enough profitability in it. Well, it currently costs, according to like one recent study, I read this just today, it costs $985 million to bring a drug to the market. And that's not, that's just an upfront cost. That's before you just to get to the market. That's not counting any like litigal legal liability that may come from the, the drug harming people. So if we had a more like libertarian world where, you know, the, the market was just free to operate where people could innovate and try out new drugs mm -hmm. and, you know, talk to your doctors, talk to people and, do, you know, there would be studies made and that sort of thing, of course, too. But, you know, if you took a drug voluntarily, and yeah, maybe it harmed you. Well, that's the risk you took. You can't necessarily go, well, now I'm going to sue this guy who made this thing and invented this thing in the hopes that it would help me. And now it actually hurt me. Well, now I'm going to sue this guy for millions and millions of dollars. Oh, that's well, hey, that brings me up to the, my next question, the tainted blood. Mm. Whoa, tainted blood. Whoa, yeah. So you're a hemophiliac or you need blood transfusions. And you get the blood transfusion to save your life. And lo and behold, it's now got uh, the HIV in it. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now you're sick and you're going to die as a result. Um, it seemed to me that they were saying in this film that the blood banks or the blood, blood ink, the big corporations weren't willing to ensure that this, there was safety in the blood supply. And there was the emotional outburst by Modine. How many hem hemophiliacs need to die? before you save them rather than kill them. And of course I wanted to say, well, all of them, no, just kidding. But right. um, and then there was the, the quote about the, the doctors acting like businessmen and how horrific yep. that was. Right. Right. And so I'm just curious, like, uh, you know, there's this, um, famous video. It's, it's, uh, Milton Friedman educating someone on, uh, the Ford Pinto and had the gas tanks that blew up. And it, on YouTube, it says, um, Milton Friedman schools a young Michael Moore. It's not actually Michael Moore, but that's how you can find it. I'll have it on the show notes page, of course. But he's basically saying, you know, Ford could make an impenet impenetrable gas tank in this massive car that, you know, could knock over buildings like a bulldozer, uh, the killdozer. In, yeah, uh, they make tanks. Yeah. <laughs> but nobody wants to pay that amount. So they're willing to pay for this level of safety for this level of car for this amount of money. And mm -hmm. if they want other cars that are, you know, safer or whatever, they can spend more money and vice versa. So he was saying that there's a calculation, there's a risk that people are willing to take on in for a certain amount of price difference. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a, I don't know if it's technically an actuar actuarial uh, that you would consider this, but there is a crossover point where people are willing to pay a certain amount for, increased safety or accepting additional risk. And 
I just wondered if if you guys saw that as um, sort of how it's presented in the film, that it's the big bad corporations who are, of course, in bed with government, in, the, in bed with the FDA in this case, uh, not willing to do the necessary things because they're costly. So they're basically trading lives for dollars. And I think that they're missing the calculus on the other side of it. Sure they are. Yeah. Anytime there's any kind of consumer product that is seen as harmful, it's they demonize the producer of that item, regardless of the, all the voluntary exchanges and all the lives that were bettered by that product. Like you were saying with the Pinto, I'm sure there have been all kinds of recalls and other kinds of items. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I'm sure there have been all kinds of items that have been brought to the market that have harmed people, you know, unintentionally. Like yeah. I can think of all the guns that are manufactured that uh, for some reason now people think they can sue gun manufacturers for improper use of guns. I, it's, it's, it baffles my mind. I think the one of the things that stands out to me about that sequence of scenes that you're talking about is that you have the evil blood bank corporations um, defying CDC uh, recommendations. And again, it goes back to kind of the cronyism because well, why should, what what incentive is there for them to test the blood for the AIDS virus when they're going to suffer no consequences, not from the CDC, and I guess not from whatever FDA or whatever bureaucracy oversees them. So what exactly is the incentive? And then you have the, the, the scene later on with the kind of like the high profile um, uh, patient, transfusion, uh, surgical patient who got the transfusion, uh, Swoozy Kurtz, who ends up having AIDS. So it took that level of scrutiny um, or that level of protest from a very high profile patient to get policy changed in that. So again, we're talking about government versus market forces. And apparently the market forces took over in this instance because you had a very dissatisfied customer and a very outraged customer who voiced their opinions eventually and got the blood banks to do what they needed to do. You know, only once the information was disclosed to them, like it right. was held. Yeah. Right. Uh, probably willfully. Right. Yeah. So that's, a, that's another strike against this uh, monopolized um, solution to these problems and back to the blood banks um, and the cronyism. I mean, that was the FDA's jurisdiction and the FDA was at the table and they were like, even saying to CDC, well, if you can't prove it, Right. Then we can't do anything. So it was like CDC can only recommend or suggest. And then it was ultimately up to the FDA. So it goes back to the you know bureaucratic nature of the state and, and competing agencies and all of these things that uh, really just hamper uh, safety and innovation and, and competition. So and again, if these neutral, you know, benevolent referees who are just standing on the sidelines and watching the plays happen, if they're not going to protect you, if they're not going to blow the whistle and make the call, I mean, what good are they? So like, why, again, do we always expect even nowadays, after all the history that all these bureaucracies have of not protecting the citizens, why are we suddenly expecting them to, to protect us against COVID or whatever new disease comes down the pike? Uh, they certainly didn't do it in this instance. Do you guys remember in that scene where – they're talking about whether or not somebody is going to start doing this blood test. Mm -hmm. And somebody at some point says, but if they do that, then we wouldn't be able to compete with them. Do you remember? Remember that? Yeah, that was the Red line? Cross. The Red Cross, right. Mm -hmm. how, how did that how did that conversation go? I think the Red Cross was basically saying that if, if it's required that we would do these blood tests, then it's not in our budget. Therefore, we couldn't afford it. We can't afford to compete with these corporations who have all this money. Okay. Okay, it's not quite the point I was hoping to make. Okay, that's well, fine. It, it is in the sense that uh, all these blood banks that are favored by the FDA or whatever bureaucracy oversees them, if they're favored by by the powers up high, what room is there for competition for another um, blood bank alternative to come in and say, "Hey, we've got we've got the 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 test that we can do," and if you know an outside investor wants to come and we'll make sure that all the blood that we're providing is not tainted is, is really clean. It's really good blood. You know, what incentive is there for, you know, a young upstart company to come in and, and offer free and offer 
clean blood to the to the population. Indeed. Now these these this information, I guess, maybe was somewhat available to in the end consumer, but probably not so much. I mean, it, this whole medical system is all messed up in any number of ways. But I can't imagine as an end hemophiliac user getting a blood transfusion, and you're like, they know where their blood came from and who supplied it and whatnot. Well, maybe it says it on the bag. Maybe it doesn't. But the Swoozy Kurtz uh, character didn't know. The the she found out from the CDC guy who was who was reading her file off to her and then told her where her blood came from. She didn't know. Right. So I, I think if it was a more open free market, of course, you would have different competing agencies advertising to certain different extents. Hey, we have this new disease test and we're going to have clean blood and then we can charge a premium and people would prefer that. I mean, I think people would be way more likely to pay a premium for actually clean blood as opposed to possibly AIDS tainted blood. And there'd be industry uh, uh, organizations like the Better Business Bureau, but for blood, uh, giving a rating to the, the blood bank companies who'd say, okay, yeah, like we trust we trust the, the testing capabilities of this particular company. And we know that any blood that goes through them, they've tested and they know that it's clean. So their their reputation will be on the line if this free market kind of uh, blood approval agency uh, industry agency um, put their seal of approval on a on a batch of blood and and it didn't it wound up having containing the AIDS virus uh, their reputation would be would be suspect so they would have every incentive in the world to make sure that any anybody that they gave their seal of approval on had clean blood. And the liability policy insurance holders, they would they would be having it's definitely have an incentive to ensure that see that they're uh, the people that they're insuring are using the the latest tests and technology. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, it seems like um, the model that was being used here, the consumer, the end consumer is so far removed from the information and the option to to even know what the price is or, or if there's an alternative that may cost more or less and have different levels of quality or safety. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you so just get blood. Yeah, you're just getting blood in, and it's an expert doctor telling you you need it and they're the ones sourcing it for you and the insurance company is probably paying for it or the government is, you know, Medicare style. Uh, so it, it, it's another hazard of removing the consumer from the pricing, right? Mm -hmm. if, if people were more sensitive to what it costs to do something, they would then make a decision that on, you know, how valuable it is to them to do it or not. Right. And, and how, right. And then how more involved you are in a decision being made, I think you take more responsibility for that decision. I think people get really upset when they go to the doctor and all this stuff is happening outside of their control and then they get hurt and then they're like, okay, I got fucked over somehow <laughs> as opposed to, oh, I chose to buy that Pinto, you know, and then it, it still had a problem or something. It's kind of on me. Right. All right. Well, um, we can move on, I think, from the blood thing. And I think we talked a little bit about the, the bureaucratic red tape, but there's one other thing related to that. And that was, um, who's the guy who was uh, the head CDC person? I forget the guy's name. Yeah, the, the guy's name, the, the character's name was Jim Curran. The, the actor's name is Saul Rubinick. Right, yeah. And so he was giving a, a press conference about you know this new a disease epidemic that's affecting people, but they don't want to say too much about it. They want to be factual and only talk about things that they can prove and maybe a couple of things that they might suggest. Um, but uh, Don had a problem with this because it's like, you're lying to the people. You're not telling them the full information. And his line back to him was, well, we don't want to jeopardize our funding on the one hand. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we don't want to start a panic in the public. We don't want to, to cause a mass hysteria. And again, my, how the times have changed. Um, <laughs> you it's know? not hysteria nowadays. Yeah. It's, it's good money to be made in hysterias. Come on now. But uh, I can see how that would be a very uh, tenuous position to be in. You have to be very careful with what you say when you're, when you're in that position of authority and you have to balance that tightrope of the bureaucracy and appeasing the politicians and, and the, the strings of your funding. So that's another strike against uh, monopolizing this via government. But the other side of it is 
the words you say affect people's perception of the situation. Yeah. Similar to how when the Fed speaks about something, uh, I mean, you know, even say we, things in the market. Couldn't even say we suspect that this disease is sexually transmitted and it's predominantly in the gay community and it's in San Francisco. Like he couldn't even say it, we suspect this. Like he had to be very careful with his words. Be again, to your point, he's got to be very politically uh, salient about what he says. And again, why wouldn't he be? His his whole incentive uh, structure is based on him keeping his job based on not causing a panic, not causing concern, and certainly not wasting a whole lot of money on something that isn't politically viable for him to spend money on. Yeah, so basically we're just saying that the system as it is is uh, pretty terrible and yeah. would be Super probably good. a lot better uh, under some alternatives. And I'll put some uh, links on our show notes page. I know um, Bob Murphy has some discussions on this related to uh, how the um, free market might respond to medical uh, situations like this, pandemics, epidemics, et cetera. And uh, also he has a, a book. I forget the name of it, but I'll put a, a Amazon link so everyone can buy that and we'll get a little affiliate commission, like 4%. So you know, 18 cents in our pockets would be nice right about now. Uh, that is about um, the healthcare market and how screwed up it is by government intervention. And uh, I think the final scene, uh, one of the final scenes, I should say, between uh, Matthew Medine and Saul Rubinek is when he, uh, Matthew Medine submits his final report about, you know, recommended plans for solving the AIDS crisis. And the, the, his boss basically tells him like, if you submit this, you will get nothing. Like if you let me edit it, you'll probably get about half the funding that you're asking for. If you submit it as is, you'll get nothing. So again, we're talking about incentives and what is the incentive, if not to 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 mitigate this this horrible epidemic that's going on in the gay community? Also, transfusions, also, uh, what well, heroin addicts or needle users? Um, you know, he's trying to make the point that if you spend this money now, you're going to save billions in healthcare later. But they're not they're not worried about that. Their incentive structure is not built to respond for cost effectiveness. They're just talking about what is politically viable as far as what, I mean, nowadays you could probably get AIDS funding out the wazoo, but back then it was, it wasn't going to happen. Not in the Reagan administration, but certainly not in the, the democratic administration, which wasn't really, was, wasn't totally on board with the gay agenda. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, as in the film, you know, the, the disease had a hundred percent mortality rate, mm -hmm. um, at, at the time. Um, but now it seems as if it's, uh, maybe been abated quite a bit. I mean, magic Johnson's been living with AIDS for 30 years. Yeah. 31 years. And yeah. I mean, who would have thought Kobe would have gone first, you know? Yeah, really? Yeah. And supposedly I saw recently that up to like 15,000 or maybe more get infected with AIDS every day. And yeah. It's, it's pretty much, it's, that's why it's a non-issue anymore because people, you never hear about, people's anybody dying from aids anymore it was freddie mercury it was rock hudson and uh now it's just all right well you just have aids and you just live with it you just take these meds and yeah. you'll be all right yeah yeah so yeah apparently currently the um the timeline for an aids patient today or an hiv patient today is about the same as if they didn't have hiv hmm. which is pretty impressive it's pretty impressive well, that's good news. I'm glad that it's uh, improved. I mean, anything that you're going to die from, certainly. I mean, yeah, we're all going to... Life has a 100% morbidity rate, right? We're all going to die eventually. It's just a matter of how and when. Um, but uh, you don't want to see people kicking off too soon. And government is one of the biggest uh, killers of people uh, in the 20th century. I think it was something like 10,000 people a day, uh, 420 million, I want to say the number was. If you look at um, R.J. Rummel's uh, information about democide and then also include wars, because uh, those, of course, only uh, make capable by governments. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of people. Um, if, if you consider that an epidemic, uh, maybe that would be the crisis that we would all be worried about.
Yeah. But that's just business as usual. So nobody gets upset. Hopefully we can just find a cure for this new flu virus and we'll be all be all right. But this, uh, this, it really is very personal to me. This whole issue is because um, I lost my dad uh, when he was 68 to bladder cancer. And, you know, he was eventually he was diagnosed as terminal and he died about nine months later. And so we would uh, go out together and, and discuss, you know, certain things. And one time I brought up to him, um, the, the 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 FDA being in the way of real medical innovation and he he was a he was a pretty staunch Republican and he even brought up to me that well if we didn't have the FDA you know we'd have how would we know that the drugs that they were taking is safe <laughs> and at that point I said to him I said well dad at this point would you care I mean you're terminal so whatever you will you could take that could possibly help you would you care and he really didn't have anything to say to that so it's it's very, uh, especially for terminal cases like my dad was, uh, I mean, I just think that the FDA is just getting in the way. And we're seeing, we saw that in the early stages of this, of this COVID um, um, whole ordeal where they were, they were, there was a lot of red tape where the, the tests couldn't get to where they needed to. And they, it took a long approval process. So what good is the FDA if, if people are dying and we're, we're now locked in our houses and can't go anywhere? We can't go to our local sports bar or, or to Robert's restaurant, for God's sake. Yeah, indeed. I mean, the, the cure seems to be maybe more harmful than the disease itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's like the virus isn't the problem. The problem is the panic. Like the panic is the virus. Yeah. It's the real virus. You know, human beings are the virus. Absolutely. And as if there wasn't the FDA, you know, there wouldn't be some competing private institution that fulfilled essentially the same function or multiple competing agencies. That's always, right. always annoying when people say invoke government as if that's the only way to do a thing. Yep. Well, and, and think of the job they're doing. Uh, Robert Higgs, who does great work uh, in his book Against Leviathan, I want to say, um, there's a whole chapter on the FDA and the number of deaths from approved drugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's in the tens of thousands a year. I mean, how many it, drugs do they recall a year? Right, exactly. So it's like, or the people right. that died waiting for drugs to be approved. Yeah, and, and you, those don't even get counted, I don't think. So you know, it's a back to the scene, unseen stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, like, we, would, would, would immunotherapy have helped my dad? I don't know because you know, even though it was it was around and then it was it was in the, under development, it wasn't FDA approved. So how how would I know? Yeah. yeah. Well, we've probably reached uh, roughly the end of our time uh, tonight. So uh, if you guys have any final notes, um, I think I got through almost all of mine. Um, we can get into summaries and reviews, but I'll give you guys the floor for a moment first. Mm, I think I went through everything. Yeah, I mean, I think the the only one thing I have noted down here is is the uh, diner scene when uh, Matthew Modine and Saul Rubinek are are kind of talking, having a serious conversation for the one of the last time, and Matthew Modine is very indignant. Like, how can how can he be such a bureaucratic whore and everything? And so, what struck me is 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 really unique about that is that here Matthew Modine, his character Don Francis, goes to work for the CDC, which is a government agency. And now he's like totally indignant of the fact that a bureaucracy acts like a bureaucracy, you know, and it's the 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 health is part politicized in a politi politicized agency. So it's it's really telling that they don't even see the problem when it's staring them right in the right in their face and then there's also a scene where those two are talking and it might be the same one where he's asking matthew modine you know if you hate government so much why are you yeah. why are you chosen to work here your whole life or whatever and he's like because this is where the bugs are yeah <laughs> which is not even true right i mean i assume that um the louis pasteur institute and all kinds of other places private. I mean, they probably take some public money and whatnots and funds, but for the most part, they're essentially private. I mean, you can, you can work in a private way to work on diseases and it right, would yeah. be far better. Um, especially if and now go fund me, it's even easier. Yeah. And if you weren't demonized for making profits, mm -hmm. I want to say, um, Rothbard has a book called uh, science and government. 
that talks about this and, and the contrast between how technological innovation happens in a free market versus in a government bureaucracy. So I'll put that on the show notes page as well. It's a really good one to check out. So with that, uh, why don't we go to Robert for your final summary review score out of uh, 10. You can go decimal point deep if you like, or, or two, whatever you want. It's a lady's choice. Well, even despite all the uh, kind of left-leaning propagandistic type agenda that this movie had, I still enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, it's it's compelling drama about you know people racing against time to save people's lives, and it really brought home the human element. It gave introduced us to some strong characters, and we didn't want to see them die. When when they did die, you know, we felt for them. Because we actually got to see people react. I mean, uh, when Gandalf was like, you know, he was going to die. Magneto. His uh, former boyfriend, who was like, what, the evil v- scientist in Jurassic Park? Yeah. comes up and he's like breaking down. You know, you know, he hasn't invented the evil dinosaurs yet, but he's like hugging Gandalf and he's like, doesn't want him to die. And, you yeah, know, B. that tugs. Wong. What's that? B.D. Wong. That's Yeah, B.D. Wong, man. Yeah. yeah. He'll yeah. go on to... Uh, Gandalf even starts speaking uh, Elvish at the end there. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a nice little callback to uh, his uh, Lord of the Rings days, which would happen in the future. But anyway, uh, I missed what John said. It's pronounced Magneto. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is uh, this is a good film. Um, yeah, I liked it. I liked it uh, quite a bit. I don't like Matthew Modine as the lead character. I think he could have been replaced by almost any solid actor at the time, like a uh, anybody really. I think it would have been better, but it is what it is. And um, yeah, it's a good, strong, like seven. It's not going to blow your doors off, but it'll entertain you for a couple hours. And I think it'll it'll humanize this the drama of the early AIDS days. And I, I highly encourage people to um there are many, many like interesting like documentaries on YouTube about the AIDS and what has done been done since this movie. So if you go from here, I know SciShow puts out a bunch of stuff. Um a lot of interesting work has been done since then that um they've actually cured cured two people yeah i saw that i saw that i actually i have an article related to the second person who was uh cured and i was going to put that on our show notes page as well so thank you for bringing that up because i was about to Mm. Mm. anyway go ahead well let's let's go to john uh for your summary and review score out of 10 yeah well first of all i take offense to the very uh indignant dissing of private joker so uh i can't abide by that but um, yeah, I, th- I again, like I said in the beginning, you know, looking at this film for the first time when I was more l- kind of left of center uh, in the day um, and looking back on it now, you know, I, I love it. F- I love the film for the same reasons, but for ve- from very completely different angles, you know, whereas like I thought it was a shame that the government let this horrible thing happened or spread the way it did um, back in the day when I first saw it. And I'm still um, pissed off at that, but, but, but for very different reasons, because I know that government could never do anything but allow this to spread. So it's, it's amazing. It's really a film that, you know, you kind of have to be in my position to have seen it when it first came out and see it again today um, and have that, change of mindset whereas like you still see the problem that existed but you see it you see it's the source of the problem from a very different perspective and i think that's why the the movie not only because of the the spectacular ensemble cast not only because it takes a very complex story and really effectively whittles it down into a two and a half hour film but i think it's it's very effective in in what it sets out to do, whether you're left leaning or you're an anarcho capitalist libertarian. Um, so I give it, I give it a nine out of 10. I love it. I love the film. 
Wow, that is that's high praise. And I was kind of hoping that uh, you'd also give us a little bit of like what was good about it um, from a filmmaking standpoint, because I, I know that has to play a role in in because all the movies you've recommended, they're beautifully shot, well paced, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really. I mean, you can tell that the direction is really strong. Yeah, I mean, I thought the 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 film was shot okay. I don't think there was anything particularly spectacular about it. Um, but again, like I go back to the the scripting of it, the editing of it, and taking what was a very complex thing. Like when you're editing a film, you have much more of the film that you have to take down to a more digestible uh, format than probably the, the the director originally intended so i'm very impressed by the way it's edited i'm very w impressed by the way it's the dialogue is scripted i thought again like going back to the storytelling as aspect of it i'm really impressed with that's with that part of it i'm usually like a huge fan of cinematography and i usually pay attention to the photography of the film but i think that's well it's fine it's it's secondary i think the the story kind of carries the film in this in this particular instance all right well thank you i, I think it was a, a fine recommendation and timely of course because it ties right into the current situation and we're all you know locked in uh, right now uh talking about movies here um so my take is that the the movie was really good it was entertaining it was action-paced uh i was in, intrigued to see what was going on and i was even a little bit lost in some of it but it was still something that i wanted to keep watching and learn more about uh it does humanize it it, it is a sharp contrast to contagion which we did a few weeks ago uh so i think that this was um definitely worth seeing and the all-star cast in this uh richard gear was in this alan alda steve martin lily tomlin angelica houston and if robert's favorite uh, matthew modine uh, so, I mean, just a ton of people in this thing and it's, um, you know, pretty well done. It almost feels like, uh, one of those, um, perhaps they had a we of the world kind of situation where they're like, everyone's kind of signing on to this movie as like their, their part in like publicizing this, um, you know, this scourge of AIDS and HIV, uh, something like that, because this came out right after I think, uh, Magic Johnson announced that he, uh, yeah. had HIV, right? So this came out in 92, 93. He, he revealed that, in, I think 91, I want to say, or 89. Yeah. I forget. He was somewhere around there. Yeah. But, uh, I, I thought it was really well done and I appreciate that you, uh, suggested it. And again, the timeliness was, um, spot on and gave us plenty to talk about tonight. So I'm going to go with an eight on this. So we go seven, eight, nine, we line them right up, uh, on this one tonight and the band played on. So, Robert, next week, uh, we're going to go to Hong Kong, I think, and talk about the oh, Jack Chan action classic from the 80s police story with <laughs> Shane Scalf of, uh, I think, I don't know if their um, show is called Hapa Sup Supremacy any longer, but it, that's what it used to be called, H-A-P-A. Uh, -A. Uh, but uh, they are, uh, Shane and Nico are the hosts and they do like a live stream uh, interview show. Um, I was on it a couple of years ago with Pat from Liberty Weekly and uh, he suggested police story. And so that's what we'll do next week. It won't really have a whole lot to do with um, pandemics. We've, we've been on this tear of contagion and smallpox and um, bats and all of these things. It, everything's kind of all been related lately. Uh, so I'll, I'll see how I can tie it in. Oh, you know what? I've heard uh, conspiracy theories that this whole COVID situation was because uh, they needed something to quell the Hong Kong protests. Diabolical. And we'll be talking okay. about based in Hong Kong. So there we go. There, that's that's the tie-in. We're, we're looking at all the. Uh, Miss that, John? What's that? I hope we're all alive to see it. Yes, yes. Hopefully we all uh, live another week and uh, can do that one uh, when we come back. So thank you guys for joining us. This has been uh, lastnighters.com slash 116 for the show notes for this one. We'll have a bunch of stuff, uh, books and articles that we mentioned. Also, John's prior appearances where he was on for Reds and uh, The Aviator. And was there something else or was that the big uh, gap between um, Aviator and Reds? Yeah, I think the, those are the 
those are the two other films that I was on here for. Okay. Well, we, we enjoy having you on and I would uh, cordially invite you back uh, sometime in the near future, assuming we're all still alive. Assuming we are still alive. I would love to. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So uh, we will uh, suggest that all of you wash your hands, maintain some social distancing, be wary of government. Don't necessarily believe everything they tell you, but also be safe, better safe than sorry. That's what I've been doing on my end. Uh, we're basically living as if this could be a very prolonged situation. So we're already like almost rationing our, uh, our foods and deciding what to eat first uh, based on how long those things are going to last. Uh, if, if, um, if things turn out being fine, then great. We'll go back to the grocery store. We'll go back to Costco in a couple of weeks. If not uh, a month from now, I'll be happy that I did this now. So uh, basically the question I would ask myself is, can you afford to be wrong? Uh, I think as a prepper or a prep prep light type person, I can't afford to be wrong. Uh, if I wasn't prepared at all, uh, I could not. So that's my PSA at the end of this AIDS talk. Uh, this is my TED talk talking about AIDS and and the and, and the band played on uh, lastnight.com slash one sixteen. So uh, any final words from you, Robert, on how people can support us uh, over here, up in here, up in here? Well, you can always join us at Actual Anarchy Patreon. You can check us out on YouTube. You can subscribe to YouTube. You can leave a comment on YouTube. You can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can tell your friends and family about the show. You can just engage with us. Not get engaged unless you're you know, single. Let me know. But yes, yeah, got engaged. So there you go. Indeed. Yes. Well done, sir. <laughs> but yeah, any kind of uh, interaction with us is just, you know, spurs us on to to keep producing content. So thank you for all your eyeballs and all your earballs. And hopefully you'll like what we have. I will second that motion. Motion carries. And uh, good night from last night, everyone. All right, and we'll continue the transmission for just a few more minutes. I, I think maybe if you listen very, very uh, intently, you can hear my new co-hosts, all 10 of them, the little chicks we got uh, that we'll be raising so that we can have our own little homestead here. Great. Now you're going to have the avian flu. Yeah, probably got the bird flu. Uh, mm -hmm. So here is the question I was saving up and, and how this is going to come out of so much left field. I've been meaning to ask this for a while. We have neighbors. We all have neighbors. They have some teenage kids, and there's some nefarious stuff probably going on. Police have been involved. There's probably some drug things going on, whatever. Loud music, uh, balls getting kicked over into our yard, uh, deflated balls, things like that. And there's probably at least a dozen of them. Now, for a time, I was returning the balls back over. And then for a while, I was like, all right, they keep sending them over. This is not a game. I'm not like volleying them back uh, to, to extend the game. Uh, so I put them all in a box after saving them for a while and put them uh, in front of their house and like, hey, here's all the balls back. And they all ended up back in my yard again. So I have now held on to them for going on six months. They're deflated, worn out balls. Uh, if I give them back, they're going to just end up back over here. And I'm also not really wanting to talk to them. It's kind of fucked up, but I don't want to like interact and say, hey, why are you throwing your balls over here? Because they're like kind of rude teenager types and a, sort of a, a mom who's like not super friendly. So my question to you, Robert, is... Can I just keep these balls as if they are now mine and do with them as I please, which would be throwing them in the garbage? Your take. This is a bit out of left field, although I appreciate the libertarian question, Daniel. I don't know what this has to do with uh, in the band played on, but it seems to me now you were you able to witness 
any of these balls entering your backyard? Uh, I think it had been witnessed at some point, but um, primarily I would just find them in the yard and they're definitely coming from there. And do you understand that these are balls that are just like kids playing in the backyard and, oh, you know, incidentally one goes over or are they like, I hope this guy motherfucker likes some balls because he's getting some balls. I think that they are just playing with them, but sort of in the, um, Rowdy teenagers might be drunk, uh, just messing around, not really caring about other people's property or anything like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's sort of my take. Okay. Sort of like well, when you Jack and home runs out of that little t-ball park and yeah. hitting cars. Yeah, exactly. This is a very similar scenario. Or it reminds me of another scenario when um, there were some neighborhood kids, two brothers, who would come over and play on the property just by themselves. But, you know, there's the only the the basketball court, the world famous basketball court that we saw the world's problems on. They would be playing soccer back and forth on that court. Well, one errant kick broke a window, but they didn't fess up to it. And then they, you know, whatever, they buggered off. And I ended up finding out that they had done it later on. And, you know, we never like made them pay for it or anything. We just, whatever. I, I, I tend to think that there was some sort of tacit allowance. Like they're on the property. We're, we're not kicking them off the property. Uh, so do they, are they really liable for any damage they cause? I can see them kicking the ball. I'm not stopping them. Or do, are they liable for that window broken? I, I think you can go either way. I, I tend to I tend to fall along the lines of they're liable for the broken window, but at the same time, I, I can't you can't get too upset because you're like, you know, it's kind of on me. But in your situation, it seems to me like you don't have an obligation to give those balls back. I, I they're voluntarily giving them to you. I, I can't see that you know you have any kind of positive obligation to go give them back to them. I think it's probably the neighborly thing to do, but, but if they I've just keep, that. you've already done that and the behavior hasn't changed. Uh, I, and they've never come over and asked for them, right? That is correct. So yeah, I don't see the issue. I, I don't I know think. if it's the pure libertarian thing, but I, I would, I'd be like, yeah, I don't know what happened to those balls, buddy. Yeah, I feel like the old curmudgeon, you know, like <laughs> hitting balls into my yard. You're not getting this ball back, Sonny. Get off my lawn. I don't know. I mean, obviously, the adult thing to do is to like talk to the parent uh, and say, hey, they're throwing these balls over here all the time. And they're all deflated, flat, you know, worn out, stinky dick liquor balls. They're they're not in good shape. You know, they're they're, they're literally garbage. They're just throwing garbage in my yard, basically. Yeah, they're throwing garbage in your yard. So what do you do with garbage? You throw it away. All I right. think you're perfectly okay. I think you would sleep like a baby having thrown those away. I don't think you should worry about that at all. All right. Well, thank you for your response on that. Um, I was hoping that our guest would still remain on, but I think he thought that we were done, and so he disconnected. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, some people a little bit of a, a of a miscue there at the end but uh uh we got we got a lot of content uh with him and uh we'll have him back sometime again and we'll be able to chastise him appropriately uh the next time he comes back so uh why don't we wind this one down robert um we can perhaps do a little bit of kathleen turner overdrive uh but i am a little bit tired so maybe not so much but uh this is episode 173 of the actual anarchy dot uh 173 for the show notes and more uh, for our episode on the and on and the band played on, uh, we will catch you guys next week when we talk about Police Story, the Jack Chan film, and uh, we will uh, say maximum freedom. Uh, stay healthy out there, and uh, see you next week. Peace out.
the chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do